On today's DAS tutorial, we are going to look at the tone mapping controls. Uh, these will give you a lot more control over your render and especially just the, the really you know small nuanced details that can really help set your renders apart. So if you're looking to move beyond the beginner stuff into a little more intermediate or advanced territory, this is definitely the kind of stuff that you should check out. So if you're new here, don't forget to hit the subscribe button and the notification bell. I do these tutorials um, two or three times per week. So uh, again, be sure you subscribe so you won't miss any of my new videos when they come out. All right, so we're gonna go over the um, tone mapping controls that I use the most. There are a couple that I don't really mess around with um, and I'm gonna leave those alone for right now. Um, I've looked into them a little bit and they just aren't things that I really feel like I need to use. So I'm just gonna go over the ones that I use the most. Starting from the very top, first of all is the tone mapping enable button. You wanna make sure that this is turned on so you can use your tone mapping controls. And the first four that we're going to look at are the exposure value, shutter speed, f-stop, and film ISO. Um, if you've ever done any type of photography, especially with uh, either 35 millimeter film cameras or with a modern uh, DSLR or mirrorless camera, then you're probably familiar with these. Um, so the shutter speed, f-stop, and film ISO make up the three points of what we call the exposure triangle. So whenever you are uh, whenever you're taking photos with a uh, camera like a like a digital um, SLR camera or any type of interchangeable lens camera, um, you want to have direct control over these three things to give your uh, to give your photo the exact look that you want. So the first one is shutter speed. This one is simply how fast the shutter moves when it when it exposes the uh, when it exposes the um, camera sensor uh, to light. So a faster shutter speed is going to let in less light, and a slower shutter speed is going to let in more light. So if you're filming with a, or if you're shooting with a physical camera, um, if you have a slower shutter speed, you're going to let in more light, which is going to make a brighter photograph. But you also run the risk of blurring. Like if you're shooting a moving subject, you generally want a faster shutter speed so it doesn't cause a blur effect unless that's the effect that you're going for. And the value over here right now, it's set at 128. So that means that the shutter speed is 1 128th of a second. So if we go lower, then it'll be 1 84th of a second. And as we go down, you can see it get brighter and brighter as the shutter speed gets slower. Um, I'll move it back up to where it was at 128, or pretty close. There we go. So since we're shooting still uh, subjects, nothing in, in our scenes is moving. So the shutter speed, we don't really have to worry about the, the blur effect or anything like that. This is basically just going to be another way uh, to uh, expose our, our shot either more or less. Um, under that, we have the f-stop, and if you've seen my tutorial about uh, basic camera controls and depth of field, then you already know a little bit about f-stop. Um, again, this one is, uh, for tone mapping uh, purposes, is mainly just to let more or less light into the shot. Uh, it's not really going to have much to do with the blurring effect, and this f-stop operates completely independently of the other f-stop, the one that we use when we're doing the depth of field effect. So um, if we move this one down, just like on shutter speed, the lower we move it, the brighter our shot gets. And then if we go the other direction, if we start going up, then it gets darker. Where was that at eight? We'll put that back where it was. There's the default value of 8.0. And then under that is the film ISO. So again, on a modern camera, the ISO is basically just an electronic way of enhancing the light in the photo. Um, so the more that you increase the ISO, the more noise that you're going to introduce into your shot as well, uh, generally speaking. Um, if you have an inexpensive camera, then you won't be able to bump the ISO up very high before it starts introducing a whole lot of noise into the photograph. If you have a more expensive camera, then you can bump up the ISO a lot more. It's a lot more forgiving, so you can bump it up more before you start to get significant no uh, noise in the photograph. And for DAS 3D, this one... Uh, this one operates uh, the opposite way that f-stop and shutter speed do. So on this one, the lower it is, the darker it, uh, it gets. 
There we go. And this one, just a little bit, goes a really long way. So let me move it back down the other direction. And then you can see it getting darker. Until we get into the negative, you never want to use a negative ISO. Um, the lowest you want to go is zero. Generally, I leave mine at 100. Oh, I'm going too low. Yeah, generally, I'll leave my film ISO at 100, which is the default value, and that's also the default value for, for most digital cameras. Um, so again, I'm, I only mess with this if I, if I need to change my exposure. Um, but uh, these all three of these make up the exposure value. So if you want a really quick and simple way to, uh, to, to adjust your exposure, you can just use the expo exposure value slider. On this one, a little bit goes a long way, but this one will automatically change the shutter speed of f-stop and film ISO to reflect the exposure value that you want. So on this one also, the lower it is, the brighter it is. And the higher it is, the darker it is as you can see. So we'll leave that on, I think it was on 13. There we go, we'll leave it right there for now. So that is exposure value, shutter speed, f-stop, and film ISO. The next one that we're going to do is vignetting. And if you've ever used uh, Adobe Lightroom, you're probably familiar with vignetting. Basically, this just creates a vignette around your photograph, like a halo of, of uh, either uh, white or black. Um, this one, uh, like a lot of controls, uh, this one operates the uh, reverse, the opposite of what it does in Lightroom or Photoshop or on a physical camera. So if uh, on Lightroom, if you do a positive vignette, it'll create a white halo around your photo. And if you use a negative vignette, it'll create a black halo around your photo. This one's backwards. If you use a positive value, it'll be black and a negative value, it's white. So let's put that at 0.5. Yeah, nothing else, go a little bit higher. Keep going. There we go, now you can start to see the uh, the black vignette appearing around the photo. And the higher we go, there we go, the stronger that vignette is. And if we go the other direction, then you'll start to see a white halo or white vignette appear around your photograph. There we go. And we'll leave that at back at zero for right now. Um, under that is the white point scale and the white point itself. So uh, in, some of my, in some of my other tutorials, we messed with the temperature of the different lights. And as you, again, this is kind of backwards to how it is on a physical camera. Generally speaking, if you raise the temperature, it shifts your color more into the orange and red spectrum. And if you lower the temperature, it shifts it more into the blue light spectrum. This, you can use this to set the white point. Basically, it's like a calibration. So whatever type of light that you're using, like if you're using sunlight, which generally tends to be of a more yellowish or orange kind of color, it can create that yellow-orange glow in your photo. Photograph, uh, you can tell the renderer to treat that color as white. Um, so that way it won't look like there's like a yellow or an orange glow in your photo, but it'll make the sunlight appear white. Or if you use an incandescent light, you can set the white point scale to be the incandescent or fluorescent lights. Um, again, and that'll just keep your photographs from having a weird, you know, bluish or a, uh, or a yellowish color to them. And it'll make it easier to set the temperature of your light as well. Um, under that, we have burn highlights and crush blacks. So basically, the uh, burn highlights either enhances or de enhances the whites in your photograph. So um, I recommend if you ever see a control that you don't know what it does, just try pushing it to an extreme value. Either save your work first or make a note of what the uh, current value is, or just use the you know, control Z, the, the undo function. Um, but just try pushing it to its extreme and see what it does. So on burn highlights, when I push that one to an extreme value, there we go. When I push that to its extreme value, you can see that the whites are a little bit more pronounced. And if I bump it the other direction, then the whites are a little bit more modeled, like it's a little bit more gray. It's a little bit difficult to tell because this is, this is loading in, in real time. But you can kind of see, again, when I bump it back and forth, there we go. Now the whites are a little bit more, a little bit more enhanced. And Crush Blacks is similar. Um, if you push that one all the way to the top, 
then you'll see that it makes your blacks a lot more pronounced, a lot deeper and a lot darker. And if you bump it all the way to the bottom, it makes your blacks a lot less extreme, which can make your photo appear brighter. So if you're doing a photograph with a lot of shadows in it and you don't want the shadows to be super dark, you wanna be able to, to see what's in the shadow, just not as much, you can try bumping down your crushed blacks value and that will lighten up the shadows a little bit. Um, and similarly, if you want really extreme dark shadows, you can bump that up a little bit higher and your shadows will be a little bit deeper. All right, under that we have saturation, which this is color saturation. It just uh, determines how uh, saturated or how bright your colors are. And again, we'll push this to a couple of extremes and see what it looks like. So the higher we push this one, the more your colors are going to be saturated and it's gonna give it kind of a, kind of a technicolor effect. Um, and the higher you push it and then it starts to get just wacky when you go really high, it just starts to look really bizarre and kind of surreal. Um, let me bump that way up. There you go. Yeah, that's an extreme color saturation effect. That's that's way too much. But sometimes you can use that to get different effects. If you want something to be really bright and colorful, you can bump that up just a little bit and gives it kind of a different look. Um, one of the best uses for the saturation I, um, control, I believe, is to do black and white photos. So if you bump it down to zero, then it'll remove all of the color from your photograph and turn it into a true black and white photo. Um, I've got a video planned for later in the week on Friday. I'm going to do another full scene and it's going to be a black and white scene. And I'm also going to show you how to use the burn highlights and crush blacks to create a lot of contrast in your black and white photos. So uh, be looking for that uh, to come out this Friday. All right, and if you go lower than zero, if you go into a negative value, it starts to give it like a film negative effect. Um, let me bump that down. And you can see it starts to go into the negative color range, uh, like you're looking at a film negative. All right, let's put that back at zero. Actually, sorry, put it back at one. One is normal. And then under that, we have gamma correction. And gamma correction is just another way of, of brightening or darkening your photo, but it uses a different algorithm uh, than the exposure value up here. It's a little bit more unnatural looking, and you've probably used gamma correction a little bit, especially if you play uh, video games on modern video game consoles, and especially if you do, uh, if you play games that rely a lot on light and shadow, like survival horror games, a lot of times they will have you manually set the gamma correction um, before you play the game, just to make sure that the lighting and the shadows are correct. So if I bump this up, you'll be able to see that it gets brighter, but in a really kind of unnatural and washed out sort of way. Not just like you're making it brighter, but it's just like you're kind of turning up the whites in the photograph uh, uh, artificially. And then if you bump it down, same thing happens in reverse. It starts to artificially darken your photo. There we go. And those are the tone mapping controls that I use the most. Um, I may do a video in the future on the CM squared factor as well as burn highlights for component. I think there might have been one other thing that I left out, but those I never really used. The CM squared factor I haven't really been able to wrap my head around, and uh, I'm not sure if it is that important. I'm going to research that a little bit more and see if I can find some uh, some good ways to use that. But that will do us all for now. If you like this video, be sure to hit the like button and uh, check the description below where I'll list a couple of the uh, assets that I used in this, especially Malia, which is my female figure. love this figure. It's a great one. Um, and you can also find some ways to support me uh, for free as well as monetarily. And that will do us for this one. Take care, and I will see you next time.